Hey everyone and welcome back. Today I want to talk to you about a very interesting inequality called Jensen's inequality. This comes up a lot more often than I would have expected when I first learned about it, and it comes up in a lot of probabilistic and statistics proofs related to data science. So when you're studying your foundations of data science, you might be reading through some kind of proof, trying to make sure that what you just learned is true, and there'll be a line in there that says this part is true because of Jensen's inequality, and at least for me, those lines often felt very unsatisfying because it had been so long since I learned it or I kind of forgot what the gist of it was about. And so it was kind of hard to accept the proof for that reason. But I'm hoping that in this video, by introducing Jensen's equality in a very uh, graph way, in a visual way, it'll be a lot easier to remember going forward. So we'll start our story on the left here with what is a convex function? There's a good chance you're already aware of this, but I wanted to make sure to cover it because a lot of what's coming next is gonna rely on the definition of a convex function. What I have for you here are two functions, it's just simple one-dimensional functions, and one of them is convex and one of them is not. Now they look very similar, but there's a key difference that makes one convex and one not. And let me start by giving you the definition of a convex function so you can start thinking about which of these is which. A convex function is a function such that if I pick any two points on the x-axis, any two points on the x-axis, and I draw up from those points connecting to the function. So actually, let me just start drawing as I go so it's less abstract. So let me just start the story over. If I pick any two points on the x-axis, here's one point on the x-axis, and here's another point on the x-axis. And then we go up and we trace up to the value of that function. So here's the first value of the function. And here's the other value of the function. If we draw the line that connects those two points together, of course I don't have a ruler, so I'll use my handy dandy chopstick here. If I draw the line that connects those two points together, then the entirety of that line, every single point on that line, needs to be above my initial function. And you can see, at least for these two points and for this function, that is true. And the punchline here is that no matter which two points on the x-axis I would have chosen for this function, if I connect those two points, just for fun, let's just do another one. Let me choose a different color so we don't get too confused here. Let me choose my first point to be here, and let me choose my second point to be um, here, for example. And if I connect those two points, again, bringing in my handy-dandy chopstick here, it's a little bit tighter here, but you can see that the entirety of that red line is above my function. No matter which two points you would have chosen on this top function, it's always above that function itself. And therefore, this top function is a convex function. Now you can see for this bottom function, there are still pairs of points I can choose where this would be true. For example, if I choose this point here and this point here and I trace up, I get this guy and I get this guy. And if I were to connect those two together, then you can see pretty clearly the entirety of that line is above my function. But crucially, it's not true for any pair of points I choose. And it's pretty easy to find a counterexample. If I were to choose this point here, and I were to choose, well, how about that same point there? And if I connect those two, let me again use my red marker here. If I were to connect those two, then again, it's a little tight, but you can see here that the entirety of that red line is actually below my function. And so for that reason alone, because I could find even one pair of points that's a counterexample, this bottom function is not convex and this top function is indeed a convex function. Now we get into the actual meat, the actual definition of Jensen's inequality, which unsurprisingly starts with the definition we just learned. So you start with some convex function f. So this purple f is a function that we're assuming to be convex. Now, just like we did in the definition of a convex function, take any two points, x1 and x2, on the x-axis. And so I've drawn a little diagram here. Hopefully it's not too small for us to get our point across here. So let me again choose a point x1 that could be right here and choose a point x2 that can be right here. So I'll call this x1 and I'll call this x2. So the first thing I wanna do is trace these two points up, just like I did on the left here, to their values on the function. So if I go up, here is the value there for x1, and we're gonna call that f of x1. So that's gonna be f of x1. And now same thing, I'm gonna trace my x2 up to the value of the function at x2. And of course, that's gonna be f, it's gonna be f of x2. 
So I have f of x1, I have f of x2. And now what I'm gonna do is again, connect those two together. And now that we got some stuff drawn here, we can start talking about the actual definition of Jensen's inequality. Jensen's inequality says that if I take my function, my convex function f, on any linear combination of my two inputs, x1 and x2, so you notice there's another thing in here called t. t is simply just some number defined to be between zero and one inclusive. So it could be zero, it could be one, and it could be anything between those two numbers. And therefore, when you put this form here, t times x1 plus one minus t times x2, you'll recognize that as a linear combination of my values x1 and x2. In more casual terms, I take a little bit of x1 and I take the remainder amount of x2. The remainder because t and one minus t, if you add those together, you get a whole unit one. So I take a little bit of x1 and the remainder amount of x2. And what does it mean, by the way, to take a linear combination on the x-axis here? That means that I'm choosing some x value that is between x1 and x2. I could go further to the left extreme. If I set t is equal to one, then this is just x1, not very fun. It's also not very fun if I set t equal to zero, because in that case, we just have x2. But if I set something between zero and one, then you can think of that as, I'm basically saying you can pick anything on this line connecting x1 and x2 on the x-axis. So Jensen's inequality says that if we take anything on this purple squiggly line we just drew, any input on this purple squiggly line we just drew, and we take the function value at it, what does that look like graphically? Well, that's going to be anything, anything on this function itself between x1 and x2. And anything we choose there, we know, Jensen's inequality says, is going to be less than or equal to the thing that comes afterward, which itself is a linear combination, except this is a linear combination of the function value, the convex functions value at x1, and the convex functions value at x2. What does that bottom part look like graphically? Well, the convex functions value at x1 is this point we just drew here. We labeled it, notice that looks the same as this. And the convex functions value at x2, this looks the same as this. If you take a linear combination, if you take t amounts of this first thing and one minus t amounts of the second thing and add them together, then as the name linear combination would suggest, you are getting any point on this line itself, on this line itself that we drew connecting f of x1 and f of x2. And so Jensen's inequality if you've been following along here, is actually just kind of a restatement of what it means to be a convex function in the first place. It's saying that if you choose any input between your x1 and x2, in other words, a linear combination of x1 and x2, and you trace that input up to its function value, so it could be here, could be here, could be here, that's the first part, that is always, it has to be less than or equal to taking a linear combination of my two function values themselves, f of x1 and f of x2, because that would be anything on the line. And so of course, this is higher than that. If I trace this up, this is higher than that. And if I trace this up, this is higher than that. And the same holds for any point I could have chosen in between. And that, if you understand that visually, if you understand that intuition, then you fully understand Jensen's inequality. Now, firstly, I'm hoping that made sense. If not, please pause, rewind, try to rewatch it, add a comment in the comments below. But assuming that makes sense, your next follow-up question, and my next follow-up question, and probably the reason that I didn't really consider this important, was, well, that's a cool little magic trick you did there, and kind of just a restatement of what it means to be a convex function in the first place. But what's the point? Why would I actually want to use this for data science, machine learning, statistics, and probability? Well, I think that is the key point I want to get across. We had to get through this first part so you understood what Jensen's inequality was. But the second part here is what I consider much more important, and the second part of this video is going to be about why is this even useful? So here's Ritvik Math pulling out this giant ugly page of math here, but I want you to not worry about this at all. In fact, let's just start with the right-hand panel here. This right-hand panel here kind of tells a story about kind of getting you thinking about why this could be useful for data science. So this first box, if you look in the top right-hand corner of this page, is a casual restatement of Jensen's inequality. So this casual restatement says that, again, we have our convex function f. If we apply f to a linear combination, then we just show that that has to be less than or equal to basically doing the opposite, which is taking a linear combination of my function, my convex function itself. And just to make sure we understand that, let me put our previous result right above. So that's basically saying f of a linear combination, f 
of a linear combination has to be less than or equal to, has to be less than or equal to taking a linear combination of my function values themselves. So that's what that's saying. And another throwaway thing I'll say here that I uh, won't prove fully is that although we only did this for two points, you'll be able to extend this to as many points as you want. So you can do x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, as many x values as you want, and this will still hold. And it's not too much work to go from the two case to the more than two case. So hopefully we can take that as a given here. So now getting back to this, so this first part is just a casual restatement of Jensen's inequality. Now, let's think about this linear combination. We left that t pretty up in the air. It could have been anything between zero and one inclusive. Now, what if you had a bunch of x values, x1, x2, x3, x4, all the way to xn, and what if you added them all together and you divided them all by the number of entries there were n? Well, that is just the mean of a set of variables, right? Well, yeah, that is just the average of a set of variables. And the crucial thing to note here in this middle box is that the average of a set of numbers is a linear combination itself. It's just that we're setting that t equal to one over n. We're weighting each of them by one over the number of things that they are. And now starting to introduce some probability terminology, the average is the same thing as the expected value. So we're fair game to use as our linear combination here the expected value. And now if we restate Jensen's inequality in that way in a more probabilistic framework, we find that if you apply any convex function to the expected value of a set of random variables, that has to be less than or equal to the expected value of applying that convex function to all of your variables themselves. Granted, this still sounds extremely theoretical, but what I'm hoping you got out of this little story here is at least an idea about why this starts to get related to machine learning and data science and probability and statistics. Because you can see in statistics, one very natural operation is to take expected values. We do that all the time in stats and data science. And applying convex functions is also a very common thing in machine learning and data science. For example, just a simple act of squaring something, the square function is convex. Taking the log is the opposite of a convex function, it's a concave function. But for example, doing simply taking the negative log, aka things like negative log likelihood, would be a convex function. So hopefully you can see why we've entered the data science domain here. And what I'll do to close this video is actually literally walk you through a hardcore proof here. Actually, it's not that hardcore. You'll see it looks a little messy right now, but I'll walk you through it. And in this proof, we're gonna actually use Jensen's inequality and I'll show you exactly where we use it we're gonna use Jensen's inequality to prove that the KL divergence is greater than or equal to zero. Now, quick note, if you're freaking out because you've never heard of KL divergence before, uh, do not worry at all. You don't need to know what the KL divergence is or even what it's for. Uh, partially because this is all just math and it's more about where Jensen's inequality comes in. And partially because the next video we're gonna make is on the KL divergence and exactly what it is and what it's for and why it's so useful in talking about the difference between two distributions in data science. So you will soon learn what the KL divergence is, but you do not at all need to know what the KL divergence is for this proof. All we're trying to do here is prove that this thing called the KL divergence is bigger than or equal to zero. So first off, here's the definition of the KL divergence. Again, don't worry about exactly what it's trying to say. Uh, the KL divergence between two probability distributions, P and Q, is taking the sum over all X values that make up this probability distribution p of x, so this is the probability for the first distribution p of taking the value x, log of p of x divided by q of x. And q of x is the probability that the second probability distribution q would take the value x. So now I'm gonna do a little mathematical trick, which is just, we know that logs, if I were to swap the p and q, so swap the numerator and denominator, I can pull a negative sign out in front of the log. That's one of the rules of logarithms. So that's exactly what I do down here. So the negative sign's out here, and I've swapped the p and the q. And now we get into the whole expected value of it all. If you look at this inside part here, we're summing over all x values, the probability of that x value, and then some metric, some value. And that is just a long way of saying we're taking an expected value of this quantity, of this log q over p. In other words, we're saying this is actually equal to the negative expected value of log q divided by p. Now, as we just casually mentioned before, negative log is a convex function. 
I haven't proven that to you, but you can take it for granted here that negative log, and you can just draw a picture of a logarithm if you want, for example, and you can pretty clearly see that no matter which two points you draw on this negative logarithm function, it's always going to be above the graph. And so negative log being convex, exclamation point, that means that what I've written here is the same as what I've written here. I've just taken this negative sign inside, so it's more clear that the function f we're dealing with here is the negative log function. So expected value of negative log q over p. Here is Jensen's inequality. Let me circle it in big red circle. Jensen's inequality. So this is saying uh, the expected value of negative log q over p. So that's basically this average of convex function part is greater than or equal to, you basically swap it. You put the convex function on the outside, so the negative log goes on the outside, and the average goes on the inside, the expected value of q over p. Now that we're able to do that, that is basically the magic trick, the hidden key that we needed in order to solve this proof. Because negative log of expected value q over p, if we expand what it means to be an expected value, that equals negative log. This inner part is just the definition of expected value. It's summing over all possible values, the probability of that value, times the value of the metric, which is again q over p, q of x divided by p of x. We see this very awesome thing happen with a p of x in the numerator here and a p of x in the denominator here, which lets us do bam, bam, that's gone. So what does this look like? The sum over all possible values of q of x. Now remember, q of x is a probability distribution, and if you sum over all possible values of a probability distribution, that is equal to one by definition of being a probability distribution. So all of this messiness resolves down to negative log of one. We know that the log of one is equal to zero, and so that's equal to zero. Now the proof is solved. We just need to circle the relevant parts to see exactly what it is we proved. Let me pull out my black marker here. We proved that the KL divergence is greater than or equal to, thanks Jensen's inequality, zero. And what we wanted to prove again is to prove the KL divergence is greater than or equal to zero. So that's exactly what we proved. And the key again was using Jensen's inequality here. So hopefully this shows you why Jensen's inequality is helpful. This is just one case, by the way, from my experience being a student and also someone working in data science, that when you wanna look at a proof of a lot of probabilistic things, very surprisingly, this Jensen's inequality thing comes up all the time as the step you need in order to complete the proof. That just makes everything really easy afterward. So that's it. Hopefully you learned about Jensen's inequality and you're able to hold on to that knowledge a little bit better than I was when I was studying all of this stuff. So if you have any questions at all, please leave them in the comments below and I will see you next time.